Thank you for the introduction and for inviting me. I wish I was there with you in person, but okay, well, <laughs> unfortunately, we cannot yet do it. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, non abelian free groups and what kind of structures one can interpret in the in this uh, first order theory. So let me start with some background. Um, so the whole thing, um, what originated actually the study of non-abelian free groups from the perspective of uh, model theory was uh, a question of Tarski posed around 19, in the 40s, 1940s. And it was, um, it was, it, it proved, it, it proved to be a, very uh, hard question to tackle. So it was only more than 50 years in 2001 that um, Salah and Kalambis Miasnikov answered the question of whether non abelian free groups share the same common first order theory in the positive. So another way to state it is what they proved is that the first order theory of non abelian free groups is complete okay actually in the the way they proved it they proved something stronger is that uh the following chain that you can see on your screens uh, f2 the free group of rank 2 f3 is the free group of rank 3 and if you consider this chain um given by the natural embeddings then this chain is elementary so F2 sits as an elementary subgroup in F3, F3 sits as an elementary subgroup in F4, and so on and so forth. Um, so I will, I will follow kind of the tradition here uh, set by my supervisor, and I will call this theory the first order theory of the free group, and I will denote it by TFG. Uh, this might be confusing for non-logicians, as of course there's not just one free group, but that's the tradition. And I guess logicians, after this big result, really understand like this uh, shortcut. Um, and even more a big result. I don't know, big, bigger, but like maybe surprising result. And I'm going to explain why this looks surprising is that this common theory is stable in the sense of Salah, like classification theory. Um, so what is stability? Intuitively, I mean, there are many ways to define stability, like through counting types, through uh, the order property. But I guess the most intuitive for people outside logic is that stability is connected or a theory which is stable admits a nice independence relation uh, with nice properties, which we call uh, forking independence. And like um, prototypical examples of such independence is um, algebraic independence in algebraically closed fields or linear independence in vector spaces. Uh, so, Salah so proved that this common first order theory is stable. And here is the interesting and surprising fact about that that although free groups have been studied from different, different perspectives, like from topologists, group theorists, and it, it was like a, a very, very well studied um, object, um, there was no use or no discovery of such independence relation that, that would be prevalent in the study of, of such groups. So it came as a big surprise that such an independence relation exists and the stability result in, in, in general was a big surprise. So now this is considered one of the, the most profound results in the model theory of groups, the stability. And to complete, uh, the picture that we have in, with respect to classification theory and other properties that we study in model theory. So uh, one thing we knew even before uh, the, um, uh, the profound work of Salah is um, that f omega is not super stable. 
so super stable is the second dividing line in Selah's classification theory. And it, th this actually division line is really what tells you that you have kind of a, a structural theorem. So uh, let me add here that F omega, uh, so the free group of rank omega um, has the same theory as the rest of non-abelian free groups, because as I said before, this is an elementary chain, F2, F3 to Fn is an elementary chain. So if you take the union, then you get F omega. Um, so if omega has the same uh, first order theory as any non-abelian free group, um, so TFG is not super stable. Um, another property um, is called equationality. So, and here is an interesting story. That's why I add this bullet here. So Selah first proved that um, TFG is not equational. So what, what is equationality? So we called a formula uh, phi x y and equation f an arbitrary intersection of instances of this formula if we plug into the y's some uh, uh, elements and we take the intersection then this intersection is equivalent to a finite sub intersection so when a, a, a formula has this property is called a, a, an equation and a first order theory is equational if all formulas are in the Boolean combination of equations. Uh, so this uh, property, equationality, was introduced by Schur uh, in order to capture a bit of a, a more algebraic kind of um, a more. It, he wanted to introduce a more algebraic definition for uh, for uh, stability. And. Uh, he observed that for uh, like a billion groups and for algebraically closed fields, um, these theories are have this property. So he introduced this notion, and for quite long, um, there wasn't a counter example, an example of a theory which was stable, a natural example of a theory which was stable, but not equational. So in principle, equation equational is stronger than than stable. Um, uh, so the first example came with Udi, by, by Udi, uh, Khrushchevsky, but that was a bit artificial. So the funny story here is the following, that when Selah answered Tarski's question, he asked uh, Udi, Khrushchevsky, so what, I, what, what would make model theorists more interested in, in this theory? And then Khrushchevsky told him that it would be nice if you could prove stability, for example, or some other NIP or something. And he gave him, for stability, he gave him the definition of equationality, because in his head, every, in, in, in his head, every natural stable theory should, should be equational. And then Salah came up with a proof that the theory is not equational, he gave the proof to Udi, and Udi remembered that that was exa exactly he reminded he was reminded the the counterexample that he had found. So then he gave him the correct definition of stability, and Salah was able to prove stability. So that that's a short story about um, uh, this result. Uh, so later with um, Isabel, we um, so actually I, I also have to say here that Salah's proof of not of non equationality is quite hard. Uh, and he uses all the machinery of his uh, voluminous work, so it expands on uh, like 1,000 pages or so. The, uh, his proof of the Tarski's uh, question, and, and so he uses all the machinery he has developed there. Uh, but later, uh, like we gave with Isabel, like a very elementary proof of the non-equationality of, of um, TFG, and actually our proof extends also to all um, free products uh, which are not Z2 times Z2. So any any free product of groups which is not Z2, Z2 is not equational. Um, a third property 
which actually now I have highlighted it in pink because this is actually property I'm going to use uh, in this talk is um, the finite cover property. So although the, the two properties above were negative, so that's one of the positive properties this theory, this theory has. So it does not have the finite cover property. And that was a property that was introduced by Kiesler and uh, intuitively it says how easy one so it's 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 like the tamest kind of property a theory could have in Kisler's order and intuitively it says that you can um, how easily you can saturate ultra powers uh, but I don't want to to go through this lens of, of, of the scope of this property, but I want to give you like how we're going to use it in this context, in this context. So NFCP for us is, uh, I'm going to give you this theorem that says a stable theory uh, does not have the finite cover property if and only if it eliminates the infinity quantifier. So in the theory of the free group for every formula phi x, y, we can assign a natural number n. So independent of y, we can say if this formula has more than n solutions, it has infinitely many solutions. So this is the way we can express infinitude. And lastly, uh, the last property that fits in, again, classification theory of Selah, um, uh, but Normally, it makes more sense when the theory is super stable, and then you look if if it has the dop or it does not have the dop in order in order to proceed with the structural theorem of Selah. Uh, yeah, as I said, although it makes more sense then when you're super stable, still you can you can check if your theory has or not uh, or does not have the dimensional order property. And what it says in our case is that not only TFG does not have a, a good structural um, theory for its models, but not even the Aleph one saturated models have a good structural uh, theory. Okay, so this is how one can uh, um, understand the DOP in this context, the dimensional order property. Now, uh, I, I will continue with some background, and I will take you from uh, to the I will take you to the study of first order theories from a different pr perspective. I would say from the perspective of geometric stability theory, and this is a perspective like introduced by uh, conjectures, mainly conjectures and results of uh, Zilber. Uh, so here in, in this context, we have the famous uh, conjecture of Zilber that said a strongly minimal set uh, could essentially either be like, um, essentially like the empty theory, like the, uh, an, an, infinite, uh, an infinite set with no structure at all, or a vector space or an algebraically closed field. That was essentially the conjecture of Zilber uh, that was refuted by Hrusovsky and his celebrated theorem about uh, a new strongly minimal uh, theory. So that was a huge result refuting um, Zilber's uh, uh, trichotomy conjecture. And from re the refutation of Udi, there was a property that, st that stood out and it was called CM triviality. Um, so CM triviality, so we can understand this ample hierarchy property. So CM triviality is the same as being not to ample. Um, we can understand this hierarchy as saying how complicated forking independence is in a stable theory. Although, as I said, it, it was, um, these notions, um, uh, one baseness or local modularity, uh, one baseness like uh, same triviality or not to ampleness, were introduced in the context of strongly minimal sets. Still, they make sense for 
for arbitrary stable theories and the modern way of of understanding the ampliarity is exactly what I said before. So what is to say how uh, complex, what's the complexity of forking independence is in a stable theory. So for example, in the first level of the hierarchy, one baseness, what we, um, not one ample theories or one base theories, we find um, abelian groups and vector spaces in the second level of the hierarchy, so uh, one ample but not two ample theories, so CM trivial theories, uh, we find Krusovsky's counterexample to um, to Zilber's conjecture, and then we have a two ample theory but not three ample uh, theory. It was the free pseudo space that was studied by Annan and Baudish. And an important result here from Katrin and independently uh, about this, um, Martin Pizarro and uh, Ziegler is that the hierarchy does not collapse. Okay. So for every N, we have a theory which is um, N ample, but not N plus one ample. Why I'm saying all this introduction is that because uh, whenever we have a natural stable theory, we one of the one of the natural questions is to place it in this hierarchy to check how complicated forking independence is. Um, and in, in particular, when a field is interpretable in in the theory, then the theory is n ample for all n. Right, because uh, when you have a field, you can define a plane like a space, uh, then um, a higher um, hyperspace and hyper hyperspace and so on. And you can use like these constructions to find these elements that uh, A0 to AN that you see in this definition that will witness all these properties. So I don't want to go through these properties are pretty technical. Um, and I will remain in what, how I have explained this as uh, intuitively that it, uh, it tells you how complicated forking is. Uh, so if we specialize now in, in the theory of the free group, so uh, the first result came from Anand. So Anand firstly proved that the, the theory of the free group is too ample, and actually he conjectured that he could place it uh, not being not three ample, possibly because he he also believed that that's a way to prove that there's no field definable or interpretable in the theory. Um, that was not the conjecture, of course, was not correct, and so. Abdurazak and, and Catherine first and later myself, we proved that actually the theory of the free group is N ample for all N. So forking independence is as complicated as possible. We found these um, elements witnessing all these properties. Um, and we proved um, this result. And so naturally, ah, Maybe something interesting here that I need to mention is that uh, Anand's proof has uh, connections with the bad group. Uh, the bad group is a group of um, that is interesting for people studying um, finite uh, Morley rank. Um, the, this conjecture of uh, Zilber about um, like this huge conjecture about finite Morley ranks, the simple finite Morley rank groups uh, being uh, algebraic groups. Um, uh, my, the interesting thing is the other way, of course. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, no, no, I said it correctly. Yeah, that's the interesting uh, statement. Um, so he imitated the proof he had. Anand had a proof that the bad group, which is a, a group important for that conjecture, so the existence of such a group would refute the conjecture, and he proved that this group is um, um, 
is um, too harmful. And he imitated his proof because he found some connections with centralizers in the free group. So he imitated his proof in the first order theory of the free group, free group and proved to ampleness. Uh, so, and as I said, then myself and, and uh, Abdurzak and Katrin proved that the free group is an ample for all n. Now, what is interesting is that this kind of behavior is the n ampleness, I mean, is um, naturally suggesting that there is a field, there is an infinite field interpretable in, um, in the theory. Uh, although there was, there was before an example by Evans, so Evans found a first order theory which is ample, but uh, forking actually is not trivial in his theory, but does not even interpret a group. So this is like uh, how I want to introduce the topic that I, I'm going to talk about today, the proof that I'm going to talk about today. So that was the conjecture now that although TFG is an ample, and that's a behavior that usually is witnessed by by um, and the existence of an infinite field, uh, TFG does not interpret an infinite field. Uh, that was a conjecture, and um, I have um, answered this conjecture on the positive, and I'm going to present to you kind of the ideas of the proofs here. Okay, so that that was the introduction for the problem. I'm going to talk about. So there were already some partial results. So one of the results we obtained with uh, Chloe, Anon, and Katrin is that a special class of formulas. So these are formulas for which the generic type is not foreign to them, or else uh, P0. Like the, so, in the free group, the free group is connected. So we have a unique generic type over any set of parameters. And so the generic type is, so for the formulas that the generic type is not foreign to them, then these formulas cannot even interpret an abelian group. So we cannot give, we, we cannot have such a formula act as a domain of a definable or interpretable abelian group. Um, I will give a particular example of this theorem for a particular formula having this property that the generic type is not foreign to it. So I, I don't want to explain the, te the technical term. Um, and another big result that I will, ba I based my, of course I extended it and I based my proof on it. We obtained with ILA and we proved that there is no infinite definable field. So there is here a big step between not being defined, not finding a definable field to not finding an interpretable field. Um, so let me give you now a, a small case, like a particular case of the first theorem as actually this particular case lies on the core of the whole proof. Uh, so before, let me introduce um, um, a, a definition about free products. Okay, so whenever we have a free product of groups, we can put a a times b. We can put an element of a free product of a free product in a normal form, and the normal form that's a pretty natural definition would look like that. So G would be a product of G1, G2 to GM, where it's GI would come from a different factor and not two consecutive GIs would be in the same factor. Okay, so that, that's, um, that's very useful to us because then we can check uh, whether two elements are equal in a free product. So we can check uh, like if they should have the same length of in the normal form 
and checking um, element by element, this would be equal in the respective factor. This would belong to the same factor and this would be equal in the, in the respective factor. So that's an easy way to check um, whether two elements in a free product are the same using the normal forms, their normal forms. Now, uh, I'm gonna use the normal forms in order to prove the following proposition, which as I said, is a, is a particular case of the theorem uh, we had, we have with the Chloe, Catherine and Anne. So this kind of formulas, this is a special class of formulas that have the following property. So I have a formula over Fn, so the free group of rank N with basis E1 to En. And these would be my basis elements. And the special property for us is that if I see the solution set of phi in Fn, and if I see the solution set of phi in Fn plus one, then these guys are different. So that is in in Fn plus one, I gain I gain some elements. Right, because Fn is an elementary subgroup of Fn plus one. So necessarily any solution of phi in Fn would be a solution of phi in Fn plus one. But the property that I have here is that in Fn plus one, I gain some solutions. The, the solution does not stay the same, right? Uh, so when this, uh, when my formula has this property, then we can prove that I cannot give the formula definably the structure of an abelian group. Okay. Uh, and here there is, I want to kind of highlight uh, a subtle point that if you do not come from logic or even model theory it might not be obvious that when we say de definable abelian group i don't mean a subgroup right i don't mean a subgroup so multiplication might not come from the multiplication of the group but it can be just some formula that would together with phi of x would satisfy the rules of being a group an abelian group okay so the proof is, is pretty simple and I'm going to give it like slowly step by step um, and, and, and also because it lies on the core actually. That, that's a core idea for, for proving that there's no infinite field. Um, so the proof is by contradiction. I start with my formula phi of x and I assume that uh, I can give it an abelian group structure. So I have this uh, for another formula, which I define as O plus, like this plus sign that would define the graph of uh, group multiplication, which is um, abelian commutative. So in the first, uh, 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 now in the second bullet, what, what we do is that we I use the hypothesis that my formula gains an element in Fn plus one. So I have this element A, which is in my solution set and is an honest element of Fn plus one. So it, it lives in Fn plus one and not in Fn, right? And I see it as a word in my basis. So I can express any element as a word in, in, my, in my basis elements. So that's, my first element. My second element B is the same word as A, only I have exchanged En plus one with En plus two. Now this can be easily seen that B also lives in my phi because I just, how I can obtain B, I can just use an automorphism that fixes F, uh, fixes Fn and exchanges En plus one with en plus two. So this is actually, since is a correspondence of, of the basis of fn plus two, of the basis elements is extends to an automorphism. 
right? So it's an automorphism. It fixes the parameters of phi. So B lives in, in phi and in particular is a nonest element of Fn plus two. So I have two elements of phi in Fn plus two and I will add them, right? I can use this my weird addition given by the plus formula and I could add. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. Why, why do you get that uh, B is not in Fn plus one? Well, because if, yeah, uh, okay, En plus two should appear, right? Non-trivially, because En plus one appears in A non-trivially, like it, it doesn't cancel, I mean. Mm -hmm. That's the main reason. Okay. So you have En plus two and then all, you, so it should appear in the word in its normal form and you cannot cancel it. Okay, thanks. Right. Uh, so I, I add them and now I get a new element Z if, so my formula O plus is gonna give me a new element Z that now Z is gonna be in an honest element of Fn plus two. Why now, why this is an honest element of Fn plus two? Because if not, if it belong, this Z belong to Fn plus one, then I could, I could use a in the inverse element and prove, so I could move A to the other side using the inverse and I could add a inverse with Z. And now this operation would be an operation in Fn plus one, right? So I would get an element of Fn plus one. So B would be an element of Fn plus one. So the addition of A plus B should be a honest element of Fn plus two. Now I will reverse what I did before. So I'm gonna exchange, I'm gonna use an automorphism of Fn plus two. And I'm, I'm gonna exchange, I'm gonna fix Fn and I'm gonna exchange En plus one with En plus two. Okay. How, so this automorphism F is gonna fix the parameters of phi and O plus because this I assume they live in Fn. And it's gonna exchange B with A, right? This is how I obtained uh, B from A. I just exchange N plus one with N plus two. So it's gonna exchange B with A, right? So what I should have since my operation plus is commutative, I should have that Z is equal to FZ, right? And that's the contradiction because if you see like Z now is an honest element of Fn plus two. And if you check the normal forms of uh, Z, E1, E2, En plus one, En plus two, and the normal form of F of Z, uh, they would be different. I would have a change where En plus two appears with En plus two. So the normal forms cannot be the same since En plus two would be a nonest element somewhere in the form, in the normal form. So that's actually how one proves that for this particular uh, class of formulas, so formulas that gain an element when you check their solution set in, in a high rank free group, uh, they cannot form, they cannot act as domains for abelian groups. Okay, do, given in, in a definable manner. Right, so uh, as I said, so this is gonna be a proposition that would be in the core of, the, uh, this is gonna be the core uh, of the idea uh, for uh, the main proof and I'm gonna call, I'm gonna give it a name and I'm gonna call it the non-commutativity argument. Uh, so 
if one tries to generalize, so what are what are the predicaments for generalizing this? So through understanding the predicaments, we, we can see how to fix things in, and generalize it. So first of all, the first and foremost is, of course, this is a very special class of formulas. And in principle, I cannot use automorphisms, right? Because automorphisms will, like, I need to know that my automorphism would fix my parameters, but this doesn't mean necessarily that I'm, like, I don't know how they're gonna act in the solution set in principle. Um, in particular, a particular case of this predicament, of this difficulty, is a case where even the conclusion does not hold. And so in this case, of course, we need to find a different argument. So what is this case is, we do have a billion groups, infinite billion groups definable in a free group. So these are the centralizers of elements. So if you take a non-trivial element and you check its centralizer, then that's isomorphic to Z, to the infinite abelian group, uh, which is even a subgroup. I mean, we don't have to try to find a fancy, like uh, a fancy formula to, to define an abelian group operation. It's even a subgroup. So these kind of, of guys, of course, if you see them, the solution set of a centralizer in Fn or in Fn plus one, it does not change solution set. And is a particular class of formulas that create trouble and cannot, we cannot use the proposition to tackle them. Um, the, that's the bad news. The good news is that apart from these formulas, so apart, if, if we find a special argument for these formulas, for all the rest, I could, we can generalize the above argument and I'll show you later how. Now, a different uh, obstacle that, um, a different obstacle that appears when we try to generalize the argument, not only for the real elements, but also for the imaginary elements is the following. Uh, so, the most natural equivalence relation for groups comes from conjugation. So conjugacy classes are going to be imaginary elements for, for us. And the first thing we, I did actually is to test if this argument, um, if this argument generalizes to conjugacy classes, right? So we have the same special class of formulas that they gain like a conjugacy class now in a higher um, in a higher rank free group and we try to play again the same argument so again i have an element a which is going to be a, an honest conjugacy class in fn plus one i have an element b which is going to be an honest conjugacy class in fn plus two and i add them now when i add them it could be the case that this like complicated uh, like formula would give me this particular conjugacy class that I have written down here, en plus one, en plus two times cn plus two, right? This product of these two elements, en plus one times cn plus two. But now, if I use this automorphism that I used that I used before to exchange en plus one with en plus two, that's just a cyclic permutation. This doesn't change the conjugacy class. That there's no there's no contradiction here. I stay in the same conjugacy class, so my operation is abelian, it's commutative. Uh, so that's another thing we we have to uh, take care of. Um, uh, but this is not as is not as hard to 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 overcome as the second uh, predicament, that is the centralizers. So for, for the third difficulty, the, the, the third obstacle, I'm gonna show you what, what to do in this case, is just we increase the number of summons and then we have, we have enough room 
we have enough permutations of primitive elements to change the conjugacy classes. And let's go one step at a time. So let me first show you how one tackles the case of centralizers. So as I said, abelian groups exists and what we are centralizers of non-trivial elements are isomorphic to Z plus. But what we want to prove now is that these Z pluses, these centralizers together with extra structure that comes from the ambient free group do, uh, do not, you cannot find an infinite field there in this um, defined in the centralizers. Uh, to this end, I'm going to use this theorem we proved with uh, uh, Daniel and says the following that uh, an expansion of Z plus. So now we have Z plus with other predicates, function symbols, etc., is proper. So it's proper means that all these, um, all uh, the proper means that the definable for the definable sets in this uh, structure do not come from multiplication alone. And right? so we have something extra. Uh, so an expansion is proper if and only if its theory is not super stable of finite rank. So in particular, if we can prove that centralizers in non-abelian free groups are super stable of finite rank, then uh, we prove that they are just abelian groups. They do not have extra structure that doesn't come from multiplication. And because we know that abelian groups are one based, so they're in the first scale, in the first level of the hierarchy, they do not interpret an infinite field. So here is where I'm using some geometric stability theory to, in order to prove Sorry, that. Just to understand, when you say multiplication, you mean this plus that you wrote in the theorem? Yeah, or you yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, there's no ring That's here. Right. Yeah, there's no ring. It's just, yeah, sometimes I say multiplication, I just mean the uh, yeah, plus, the Z plus. Yeah, there's no ring. This would be horrible if there was a ring here. Um, um, so, yeah, so it boils down to prove something in. Um, uh, st like stability theory, geometric stability theory, that centralizers are pure groups. So this is what we want to prove. Uh, again, I repeat what's the idea, why that's enough. So if we prove that centralizers are just pure groups, then we know their abelian groups are one-based. So one-based means they are in the lowest level in the first level of the ample hierarchy and they cannot interpret a field, an infinite field, because an infinite field re like um, increases the complexity of forking independence, right? Is if the existence of an infinite field makes it an ample for all n. Right, and I, I think I have already like revealed the way to prove this is to prove, I'm gonna prove that centralizers have Lascar rank one or U rank one. Uh, if if you like are not like very familiar with uh, model theoretic ranks, you don't need to know like much about what is uh, U rank one because uh, in this case you just need to prove that every infinite definable subset of the centralizer is generic in the sense that finitely many translates of this subset cover the whole centralizer. Uh, proving this proves Lascar rank one. Um, now there is, we gain something using model theory here that we only need to, to care, we only care about um, um, about subsets of the centralizer and not definable subsets of the centralizer and not definable subsets 
of some Cartesian power of the centralizer. So we work in dimension one, we gain something. Of course, we, you cannot only gain, you lose something as well. So what we lose here is that when we deal with ranks, in order to prove that something has a certain rank, you need to work in a saturated model, right? Like you cannot work in a standard model and argue uh, that um, your rank is set. And here comes to the rescue, the theorem about the finite cover property. So as I said at the beginning, that's one property that I'm gonna use uh, for the proofs here. Uh, so knowing that the free group uh, doesn't have the finite cover property, we can, as I said, we can express infinitude so if we had such a bad subset, subset, infinite subset in some um, element, uh, saturated elementary extension, I could express, I, I could use a first order way to express that is infinite and generic and drag it back down to a standard model. So I could express infinitude by an FCP and already can express generosity by stability. So, uh, so this is where an FCP is used. If I have a bad set subset, an infinite subset, which is not generic in a saturated extension, I could drag it down to a standard model using an FCP. So I can, so, so now what is left to be proved that every infinite definable subset in a standard model of a central, in a standard model of a free group is generic. Uh, now, so this little detail that is left is not at all easy to prove, right? Uh, one has to understand really definable uh, sets in, um, in non-abelian free groups, even in startup models, that's not an easy task because we have quantifier elimination, but not um, a full one. We have up to Boolean combination of for all exist formulas. And uh, yeah, that's, again, that's not an easy task to, to check, um, to check how infinite uh, definable subset of um, of centralizers look like. Anyway, um, so that, that's a, a non-obvious statement that whenever we have such an infinite subset, then we proved with ALA that it contains an, an arithmetic progression uh, up to a finite set. So when you have such an arithmetic pro progression, of course, you can, like finitely many translates of this progression would cover uh, the centralizer, and this is what uh, like um, concludes this proof. So centralizers are pure groups; they are one-based. They cannot interpret a field, and this is kind of completely different argument from the main path, like the, from the core of of the of the idea. And it, it had to be com a completely separated argument. There's no way that the main, the core idea was extended to centralizers. Right. Um, uh, now for, uh, for the second, um, um, for the second kind of difficulty about imaginary elements and in particular conjugacy classes, I already gave a hint of how one can tackle it. So, in this case, what we do again, let's stay, let's stay in this special kind of formulas that they gain an, an element. When you look the solution set in a high rank free group. So now instead of just having a and B, so a would be an FN plus one, B would be FN plus two, and I will add them. Now I'm going to repeat my, my, construction and I'm going to have like as many summons as I want. Like I think four or five are enough, but I, I can have as many summons as I want. Now, Z, so 
and I add the summons, the result is going to be again a true an honest element of the highest uh, rank free group. And now the idea is that I do not have just one permutation, right? En plus one with en plus two, but I have as like I have uh, k factorial. I have the full like I have many permutations here. So I can permute a one, a two, and like whatever I want. I have many permute. I can permute everything, and since the operation is a billion, the results should be the same. But then one can prove that once you have this much freedom, then you can actually. So this is the purpose of this lemma uh, down there, that once I have enough freedom uh, of uh, permuting um, things. Uh, I can increase the number of uh, conjugacy classes. And actually, we. so why I'm highlighting the case of conjugacy classes? Because from all imaginary element, imaginary sorts that we will see later, the conjugacy classes would be the harder to move, would be the harder to change. Um, so this is how we tackle conjugacy classes, and we still remain using the same argument. I just changed, tweaked a little bit how many summons I have in the argument. And uh, now, finally, and now we have to deal with the real thing, and we don't have any. Um, special formulas anymore but we need to tackle the question for a general formula it's a formula without any assumptions of how it looks like special properties or whatsoever uh, now that was a pretty hard and technical um, as I said before, although we have elimination of quantifiers, we don't have a good grasp of how these basic formulas look like. So we I we needed to to replace uh, like creatures of logic formulas with constructions of group theory, where in the work of Sela we had tools to to handle. So I'm gonna, so the idea is to replace first order theory uh, formulas with a construction with constructions called uh, towers. So towers are groups that are constructed in a particular way using uh, surface floors and abelian floors. Um, so I'm going to define what's the surface floor, what is an abelian floor, and then I'll give you the pic the whole picture of how a tower looks like. Right. So now, this is in the context of of Basser theory or amalgamated free products, ancient and extensions, and graph of groups. So we say that a group G uh, has a surface floor over a subgroup H if we can see it as a graph of groups where there will be a center vertex vertex whose vertex group is going to be um, a, 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 the vertex group is going to be a surface group that is a fundamental group of a surface with boundaries as i have so the picture here that i have is a semi topological semi group theoretical when you see a surface here with its boundaries it it means that this is a, a, a vertex group whose graph of groups is, is this surface group and uh, is this surface group and it connects to other vertex groups through cyclic subgroups which connect to the boundary subgroups of the surface. So when we can give uh, group G, such a graph of groups decomposition, where we have a center group, which is a surface group, and it connects to the rest through the boundary groups, then we say that G is uh, a surface floor over H. So H now is a free product, 
uh, H could be a free product H1 times H2 times Hm. So that's the construction of a surface floor. Uh, a billion floor has a similar construction. Uh, it's much easier. You just glue on your subgroup H, you just glue a free abelian group over a maximal abelian subgroup. So that's that. And again, it's an amalgamated free product in the language of, uh, of Basser. Um, usually E is a maximal abelian subgroup in H. So in our case, it's gonna be Z. It's gonna, it's gonna be because yeah, maximum abelian um, groups in torsion-free hyperbolic groups that would be our constructions um, are, are Z, are, are, like infinite cyclic. So using abelian floor, abelian floors and surface floors, we get towers. So a tower is a nested construction where we start with a nice floor, a, a nice ground floor, which is a, a non-abelian free group or just a free group. And we start gluing uh, floors. So we start with F, we glue a surface floor with then on the on, on, on what we have uh, obtained, we glue an abelian floor, then maybe another abelian floor, and, and that's the way we construct um, towers. Okay. So what's the importance? Why we moved from first order formulas to towers? So the, the importance comes from this theorem of Slil. So the punchline here is the following. We can, uh, we can, um, um, replace a formula by a tower by losing something. So we, we're gonna lose the exact solution set, we're going to move to something bigger. That's why it's called the Diophantian envelope. So it envelopes the formula, it envelopes the solution set. But we gain something, we gain that we have an, an algebraic understanding of how a solution might look like. And if you now go a step back and consider a situation so what we want to do, we don't really want to understand exactly how our formula, how the solution set of our formula looks like. What we really want to do is that to find two elements that do not commute, right? So is, is enough that I have some partial understanding of how the some solutions look like. So for our purposes, we don't lose much by moving to an envelope. Uh, so uh, let me state things properly here. So here is how the theorem of, of Selah goes. Uh, so to every first order formula phi of x with parameters for from our fixed non-abelian free group f, we have finitely many towers, right, over f over this parameter free group. And so these towers are groups. Right? Our groups are constructed in a particular way. So uh, the groups have, so they would be finitely presented actually by construction. And so the, these groups have a certain presentation and I can prescribe in my presentation of the group, some elements that would be part of the generating set that would correspond to the variables of my formula. So this X here in the formula and the X in the presentation of the GI is not a, is not kind of a mistake or a typo. It, this cor is cor these elements correspond to the variables of the formula in the following way. So I take the presentation. If I take the presentation of my groups and I existentially quantify the, the rest of the variables, the UIs, then uh, the solution set covers my original solution set. Okay. Of course, that's not hard to do, right? If I take X equals X, I could cover everything. The, this first uh, um, point uh, is not the main point. So the main point here is that now these 
envelopes as close to the are, are close to my original set in the sense that if I know that there exists a test sequence which is a test sequence is it's hard to explain in full generality um, because um, it's it it takes a lot of background to explain what a test sequence is in full generality. But I will give an example later. So so what we have so the main point of the theorem is that there exists a test sequence for each tower. Such, so the test sequence is a sequence of morphisms from the group of the tower GI to our parameter free group F that the values it gives to the to the to the generators x live in my define in, in my definable set phi okay so i cover my envelope my towers if seen as a as if seen as a definable set cover my original formula and moreover i i have some control over some solutions. The test sequence, a test sequence is a, is a sequence uh, of, of um, morphisms of my tower that live in the set. Um, so we gain something. We gain, we gain some geometric understanding of some solutions of the formula. And this is what I'm going to exploit in order to to generalize the original uh, idea of the non-commutativity argument, so let me give you an example of how these uh, their funding envelopes work. So I will give you like the, the simplest example. So the simplest example is uh, that we have a tower with no surface floors or or a billion floors. So we have the parameter. Uh, free group F and just another free group uh, uh, with, whose base is U1 to UK. Like that's the simplest uh, tower. It doesn't have floors. It's just the bases, ground floor with a parameter free group and another free group. Now, a test sequence in this case is a sequence that stays the identity on F and sends u to a tuple a n such that this a n this tuple a n satisfies a small cancellation c prime one over n as n goes to infinity so this small cancellation uh, properties have been well studied by by uh, geometric group theorists and before that combinatorial group theorists uh, what what does it say? The small cancellation property. It says that if some piece appear, some uh, subword appeared in a one to a n, and if it if it appears twice, like some cyclic permutation of it appears twice, either in the same element or in some other element of the tuple, then this piece cannot have um big length in comparison with the length of the of the top of the element it appears so it would, it would have the one nth of the of the length of, in the element it appears um that's what the small cancellation property is about and so in other words it says in in this particular case i'm going to use it for this example is that uh, an as n goes to infinity will break any word it cannot be a solution if i put it in a word w of x and instead of x i plug in a1 a2 a a m a k a a k then this word is not going to be one. It's, go, it's not going to be trivial. Like the, the, I cannot have cancellations that would make the, the word trivial. So this is the way I'm going to use it in, the, in this example. OK, so we have this tower. So what is the theorem of, of Salah? 
right? For a particular formula. So I have this particular formula, P of X, that says X is a product of a square and a third uh, power that do not commute. Okay, so that's my definable set. So yeah, E1 squared E2 third is for example, uh, something in the solution set. Now I have to substitute what the theorem of Slil says that I can substitute this formula by a tower that will cover the formula if I see it, if I see the tower as, as um, a Diophantine set it will cover the formula and moreover, a test sequence of the tower would live in uh, the definable set. So indeed, so the tower that corresponds to this formula is actually, okay, F I take my parameter set, well, this doesn't play any role here because I don't have parameters in my formula. And I free product it with U1, U2, X, so the group that is generated by u1, u2, and x, so x of course would correspond to phi of x there, with the relation x equals u1 squared u2 third. Okay, that's a free, so actually this presentation is equivalent to the presentation I have written afterwards. So f free product u1, u2, right? Uh, so that's a, a free group of rank two, u1, u2. Um, now this of course covers if if I see if I if, if I see the, this presentation as a Diophantine set what is what is the Diophantine formula is there exists u1 u2 says that x equals u1 squared u2 third that's everything and that of course covers phi of x because that's everything e everything can be expressed as as a product of a third and, and a second power. But uh, what I know, so what I gain is that a test sequence, now I know that test sequences live in my definable set. Why? What is a test sequence from the first point is a sequence that eventually would satisfy small cancellation property, right? So it's gonna, it's gonna give the U1, U2 values that eventually won't commute. Okay, so that's it. So that's why my test sequence will give values to X that are gonna live in the set. Uh, so, um, and that's an example of a Diophantine envelope and how, what is the, so why we want to, to pass from definable sets that we don't understand well to towers that at least uh, we understand, we have some geometric intuition of, of the solution set. They are test sequences. Oh, I have, right. Now, the next important step is that, okay, we can replace our definable set, phi of x, but we also need to have a control over the operation of addition, right? Like if we add two elements and we don't have any control, the, we, we, we cannot do anything. Like, like in, in the first, like in the proof of the non commutativity argument, we, we had a control of A and B. We had a control of how they changed when, or at least we knew that if we add them, they wouldn't go in a lower rank free group. So to gain a control over the solution of, of addition, we have to use a um, generalization of Merchliakov's theorem. This should be thought as implicit function theorems for groups. So in order to connect with for in order to connect with our purpose, we need to consider here that 
sigma x y equals one is a system of equations that is going to give us the product operation the that yeah the addition so x we will plug into the x's the summons and the y is going to give us the product this is how we should read it in order to understand what's the importance uh, for our purposes. So Merchlakov, Merchlakov proved the following theorem. If we have a system of equations and we know that for a free group F, for all X, there exists Y such that the system uh, is uh, true, is one, then we can express y so we can express this um, solution y for us y is going to be the product of the sum of the summons we can express it in terms of x and the parameters so there is a word says that whenever you give me an x say e1 squared e2 third e3 fifth i'm going to give you y that will make that will solve the equation so this y is going to be given as a word in x's and and the parameters and this gives us a control over the product so the product is going to be a word it's very close so it's it's a step up from the product be given by the product operation of the free group right so the simplest word here would have been to be x1 times x2 times x3 that this word the formal solution is such a word for example of course it cannot be that like strong the theory, this theorem but it's just a step up so the product is going to be given to us by a word not the word we want x times y x one times x two, but some word is still a gain. It's still we gain much. We we gain some control over how the product would look like. Now, of course, uh, there is a, a huge but here that sigma is not an arbitrary formula. Is not like is it's just an is it's just a system of equations, right? Is the quantifier free formula the simplest form not even inequalities actually this theorem does not hold if i add inequalities if i add inequalities this theorem does not hold and of course we would have liked this theorem to hold for an arbitrary formula not just a system of equations or a quantifier free formula and that was uh, the scope of, of a nice result we obtained with um, ILA. Of course, we had to relax uh, some, something in the conclusion and we had to make the um, uh, hypothesis a bit stronger. Now, in the hypothesis, I have an arbitrary formula, phi x y, but I don't have just for all x there exists y but i need to restrict myself to for all x there exists boundedly like finitely many y and because i have nfcps boundedly many y i have boundedly many y such that the formula holds for us it works because like if i ha if i have a product operation of course I, I will have a unique like y right if we uh, is a is a product operation that x are my summons and y is the result. I would have a unique y. We have to also add that this does not. I do not have that it holds for. I would have it that it holds for a test sequence. So if I have for a, a, a tower. So I don't want to now to make it even harder and more technical and, and talk about hyperbolic towers, but let's simplify things and suppose I have it for any tower. So if I have for a tower, a test sequence and a tuple of sequence, a, a sequence of tuples CNs that satisfy the formula, then 
I can find a formal solution. I can find a group element in the tower in G such that for any other test sequence, it would give me the correct Y. It's image under any other test sequence, it would give me the correct Y. So this says actually that what uh, intuitively um, like the, how I'm going to use it is that when I deal, when I deal with test sequence, I have a control over the product. The product is going to be given to me by a word in some group. A group that would be the group of, um, of a tower. Uh, so uh, this actually is the main, uh, the difficult result that we had to prove in order to move from uh, special class of formulas to general formulas. Uh, we have we had to extend Merchliakov's theorem for formulas um, that are uh, uh, special in this in this uh, way. That was the main technical result. Now. The last piece of the puzzle is so all I said before are enough in order to show that there are no definable infinite fields. The, um, we we had enough uh, to tackle this question. Now, in order to move to non in, non infinite interpretable fields, we have also to tackle imaginaries. So that is. I'm using here the theorem that says that, uh, like uh, something is definable in a first order theory, if and only uh, is interpre interpretable in in a first order theory, if and only if is definable in the the um, theory in EQ. So this construct Selah's construction of adding to the theory extra sorts for all uh, zero definable equivalence relations. Uh, so we have now to work in TFG together with the imaginary sorts. And in order to do so, we have to, we have, to have some control over the imaginaries. So we need to know how, like what they, what they look like. And here we use a theorem by Slil again, that we have actually three families of imaginaries. First is conjugation, right? Conjugacy classes. Then we have an equivalence relation in couples and is uh, like left cosets of centralized and powers of centralizers. And this is a family because M could vary. Okay, M could like the power of the centralizer could vary. And we have another family of double cosets, again of centralizers. And again, that's a family as M and N, the powers of the centralizers use could vary. Uh, so these are the basic uh, equivalence relation. And what Slil proved is that actually with this imaginaries, with these imaginary sorts, we can eliminate all rest. We can eliminate the rest of the sorts in the form of the following theorem. So whenever we have an equivalence relation, um, then we have, so to each tuple of the given equivalence relation, we can assign finitely many and actually uniformly bounded many uh, tuples that would live in the basic sorts and um, and two equivalence classes two elements from the same equivalence class would have the same representatives from um, from these uh, um, from these uh, tuples uh, so the important thing here is, of course, the uniformly bounded that we can treat equivalence class. Uh, we would have at most these many tuples coming from basic sorts, and this won't depend on on the class 
All right. So, and now we are, so we have all, all arsenal, like all tools ready for the final argument. So before the, the full final argument, I'm going to give you this proposition that is actually the non commutative argument, but now when we allow our formula to be X, to be an, uh, uh, to be a variable from the imaginary sorts and not just the real sort. So the, the proposition is, is the same. So we have a first order formula. It's a special formula in the sense that it gains an element when we check its solution set in a high rank free group. And still in this case, we cannot give it a, a definable abelian group structure. So the, the first uh, argument, uh, like um, the first steps look the same. So it's proved by contradiction. Suppose we can give it an abelian group structure and we start with an element, which is a non element of Fn plus one, and then we move it a lot. We move this element a lot, AI, uh so how much we move it so how how many more um 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 equivalence classes we need depends on e the equivalence relation and the bound gi given by slil in the previous theorem right and then we add them so this K, if we have K many summons, this K depends on the bound that Slil gives a priori for the equivalence relation. So this is important. So that's the importance that um, the equivalence classes are uh, uniformly bounded. The tuples that we get of basic sorts for each class is uniformly bounded. So then we can decide this K, otherwise we wouldn't be able to decide this K. And we have this Z, the outcome, so the, the sum of this operation. And I'm, now I'm, I'm permuting K, okay. So I'm permuting K, it means I, I'm gonna permute the summons so Z would correspond to a tuple. Z would correspond to a tuple of basic sorts. And as I said before, the sort that might not be able, might not be obvious, but the sort which is uh, the hardest to move around is the conjugacy class. Um, that's why here I'm saying that if I choose K large enough, which I repeat, K I can decide already from E, from the equivalence class. If I, if I choose K large enough so that I would have more than these many tuples, I would, I would move like the solution set of the relation R E a lot. And if I move it a lot, I cannot stay within it, okay? I cannot stay within it. So this permutation will change Z. And that's the contradiction. So that's the contradiction in when, when we work in uh, TFG EQ with the imaginary sorts. Um, and now more or less, this is how the final argument goes. So I start with a formula in some uh, sort E, some equivalence relation E and I assign to it, it's their found an envelope coming from the work of Slil. Now here is uh, a division point. If all my, if in my their found an envelope, all my uh, towers are only have a billion floors, not, have, not surface floors, then I can prove that my set phi of X is, inter is actually can be coordinated by centralizers. Since we proved the centralizers are one based, now we can use a theorem of Wagner to prove that my phi of X is one based so it, it cannot interpret an infinite field, All right? So I can restrict myself to the case where I have at least one surface. 
in, in the construction of one of the towers of the envelope of a of x. Once I have one such surface, I'm gonna construct a multiplet, a multiplet that would correspond to the n summand of, of the formula. Uh, n, again, depends on, on, on the equivalence uh, relation. So it's highly important here that it's uniformly bounded. Otherwise, I, would, I wouldn't be able to, to decide this n. And I get this tower uh, as a multiplet of towers. So I, I keep sticking the same surface floors and abelian floors in, in, uh, in the same way multiple times. This is the same. This corresponds to moving en plus 1 to en plus 2 to en plus 3 to n. So this is exactly the construction, but uh, for towers. And this is what we do now. So we use the implicit function theorem on the multiplet tower and the formula that gives me the n summons, um, the n summons for the addition, right? So I'm going to get a formal solution somewhere in this multiplet of towers. And if I, and if I change the, the test sequences for the different branches of the towers is the same as changing en plus one, en plus two, en plus one. So this is the corresponding argument for towers. Of course, it takes here some effort, like with uh, normal forms for, uh, it takes some efforts uh, dealing with normal forms in uh, because normal forms here are not just normal forms for free products, but for we have a graph of groups, but still we have normal forms and we can contradict. So uh, we can we can see that we have moved a lot. We can move a lot the the sum of the sum and, and so take it out of what it should be. So a contradiction to a B and it. Uh, so that, that was the final argument. So the, the theorem, the, the main theorem is as follows. So if we have a definable set, is either internal to a finite set of centralizers, so it's one based, or it cannot be given definably the structure of an abelian group. So there's no infinite, there's no infinite interpretable field uh, definable in a non-abelian free group. And now this generalizes to the whole theory. By this, I mean that we, you cannot interpret an infinite field in any other model of the theory of the free group by using NFCP. Because the only thing you are missing is to say I'm infinite. Otherwise, the axioms for fields are first, like you, you can express them in a first order manner. The only thing you cannot express is that I'm an infinite. Uh, I'm an infinite field, but by NFCP, we can also express I'm an infinite field. So uh, in no model of the first order theory of the free group, there exists an interpretable infinite field. Okay, so um, I'll finish here. Uh, <laughs> thank you for your attention. I hope it wasn't too e e intense, intensive. <laughs>